Welcome back everyone to Oddballs and Outcasts. Today I'm with Aman the Girl who likes to be known as Dog the Girl on social media. I have the privilege of knowing him for a number of years. He is an athlete, he is a gym freak, but more importantly, he's an amazing person and today you're going to learn a lot more about him. So Aman, tell us more about yourself. Before we begin you mentioned that I like to be called Dog the Girl on social media. I want to clarify that because a lot of people think that I am trying to claim to be a doctor yeah. or something of that sort. About So tell me about Dog the Girl. Like what is the perception of people? Why do they yeah, yeah, so a lot of people think that I'm Dog the Girl because I'm a doctor or I'm claiming to be a doctor or something of that sort. That's just my Instagram handle. I am Aman Dugal, but uh, my name is not as uh, unique as uh, yours perhaps, Pranav Shane. <laughs> So I couldn't get Aman Duggal. So I tried a few different permutations and combinations when I was making my Instagram handle. So I tried Aman Duggal, Duggal Aman. I tried Coach Aman, Fit Aman, something of that sort. I think you I had work a, in the... an account called Champ Duggal as well, which Champ, is your dog. Yeah, yeah Champ Duggal is there. <laughs> it's still there. It's still there. Yeah. Champ's account is still there. But I wasn't able to get something. So I just tried Doc Duggal. And I don't like the underscores. I think underscores and punctuation and Instagram handles are eyesores. That's what I tell my students as well. So I just wanted a nice little elegant Instagram handle. And Doc Dougal is what I landed on. And a lot of people then thought that because it's Doc Dougal, that I'm claiming to be a doctor or I am a doctor. So that's uh, one way people make an attempt to attack me. But I am not a doctor. I just happen to be known as Doc Dugal on Instagram because that's my Instagram handle. Yeah, It's not Dr. Dugal, it's not D.R. Dugal, it's D.O.C. Dugal. So uh, that's the Doc Dugal story. Yeah, so can you tell us more about what you do and how you've made a name for yourself over the last few years? Right. So right now I do two things essentially. I work in the fitness industry as a coach and as a teacher. And as far as coaching is concerned, this is something I've been doing for close to 10 years now. I ventured into the fitness industry in 2014. And since then, I have been coaching both in on, offline, in an offline setting as well as in an online setting. Now, I just co coach athletes online. And um, teaching is something I started in 2021. I used to do a few guest lectures for companies, for universities. I've also done some extended teaching for universities as well. But my goal was always to help aspiring fitness professionals make a career okay. in the fitness industry. I didn't have any guidance when I ventured into the fitness industry. So I figured out most of the things myself. Now that I think of it, it's not entirely true I, that I didn't have guidance. I did model my career around some of the other people in the industry who are also coaching and making a name for themselves. But compared to other careers, there isn't like a step-by-step -step approach to make a name for yourself in the fitness industry. So that's what I'm currently doing. I have um, my coaching, which has been going on for a long time. And in October of 2021, I started ADU, which is the Aman Dugal University. And that is where I teach aspiring fitness professionals how to build a career in the fitness industry and um, get acquainted with all the different skills and subjects which they are required to understand, to practice. Yeah, because I've seen I've seen your Instagram and you've been working with people who are weightlifters as well, who are competing in powerlifting competitions and stuff. So how did that come about when you've not done that yourself? Like, how did you gain that knowledge so that you can give? Right, so powerlifting is something which I started back when I had a football injury. So it started off as a passion sport for me. Uh, the, one of the things which I tell everyone is the gym is a beautiful place. Even if you have an injury, let's say your ankles aren't working for whatever reason, I had an ankle injury. You can still use the gym to exercise the other, yeah. the upper body and you can obviously um, get rid of your ankle and work your lower body as well. So there are many opportunities which a gym environment gives you to train, train your entire body. So I became a bit of a gym freak back in my college days and um, just bodybuilding wasn't enough to, I think, satisfy that little competitive attitude which football develops in you. So I started uh, attempting to become stronger on a few exercises. And that's around the time when powerlifting started becoming popular in India. And powerlifting consists of three exercises, the squat, the bench press and the deadlift. 
the barbell back squat, barbell bench press, the flat barbell bench press and the barbell deadlift. And I took that up as a sport. Won my first competition in the Sheru Classic. And uh, that's about it. I didn't take my powerlifting endeavors beyond that because by that time I recovered, started playing football again. Yeah. But um, the reason why I became a coach or other powerlifters and other athletes started recognizing me as a coach and they started hiring me as a coach wasn't necessarily because of my powerlifting exploits. I have very mediocre numbers to say the least. It's because of the information which I was putting out on social media. So back in the day, I used to run my Facebook page. Okay. And through Facebook, I used to write uh, a few posts, a few articles. And people started recognizing me for the education which I share. And uh, that's how they started associating themselves with me. I started working with them. And once you work with a few athletes, then other athletes start yeah. uh, wanting to avail your services as well. So that's how it uh, it it went forward. So was this always a plan or it's something you stumbled upon? Coaching was part of the plan. Um, that was the only service which I felt I could monetize back in the day. Because I didn't just want to share education. I wanted to make some money in the fitness industry because I was leaving engineering. Yeah, And um, I completed my engineering, but I didn't pursue my engineering job. So I wanted to quickly monetize my fitness uh, interests and the fastest way I could think of monetizing it was through through coaching. So that was part of the plan. And uh, yeah, I, I'd like to believe I'm quite strategic with whatever it is I do. So for the most part, the way I've um, gone about my, my work in the fitness industry, it's been largely part of a plan. Obviously, that plan keeps adjusting. I wanted to launch my teaching in 2018 but uh, I wasn't able to so but I did eventually launch it in 2021 but for the most part I, I have like a certain vision for myself in mind and uh, I'm slowly trying to chip away at that and I think your journey is also a pretty unique one because most people in your industry they are uh, you know taking a lot of supplements they are taking meat and all of that but you are on a vegan diet so how is that I was vegan for a long long period of time I'm not vegan anymore. So I'm, you've stopped? Yeah, I've stopped veganism. I still support veganism. I still support a plant-based diet. However, I do not think when it comes to optimizing your health and performance, a plant-based diet is your best option. Even with supplementation, you can be left with a few deficiencies or insufficiencies, which uh, makes a plant-based diet uh, difficult to recommend if your goal is to optimize your diet for health and performance. But uh, I did follow a vegan diet and I had great success with my vegan diet. I think the strongest I've been, my powerlifting endeavors were yeah. all done on a plant-based diet. And uh, yeah, I still support veganism. But what happened? Why did you stop? Where did you feel that you were lacking, that you needed some so, something additional? So, you know, the pandemic came about, right? And the pandemic hit the fitness industry more than other industries because the gymnasium shut down. And it wasn't so much the gymnasium shutting down which affected me financially. It was the fact that the gym is my outlet. Yeah, It's a place I go to to exercise. I meet my friends there. And of course, uh, uh, the, the fitness industry got hit financially as well. So that took a financial, I won't say a financial toll, but... When you're used to getting a certain amount of money, making a certain amount of money, and then that you don't make that money anymore, it's not pleasant. That, along with the fact that there's a little fear set in, my mom and dad are doctors, so they have to keep going to the hospital and I was a little afraid for their health also. I just uh, started doing... Um, uh, I just didn't do as well mentally. And I started getting symptoms of depression and anxiety. Full disclosure, I was diagnosed with clinical depression and anxiety. Sought treatment, uh, took my medication. And then I also thought to myself that I should look at my diet and see if I can optimize some things in my diet to ensure that uh, I'm not as vulnerable to depression and anxiety. And there is something in the literature. There, is, there are hints in the literature which 
which uh, which claim that plant based diets are a little more uh, susceptible to depression and anxiety like symptoms now they haven't been established um, in a, in an experiment so these are largely observational studies but when you're depressed and anxious you just want to do whatever it takes to get better yeah and i thought to myself okay if i can include maybe some, maybe some animal products and start feeling better let me do that so i started including eggs and i started having some seafood my whole idea was that okay if i'm going to if i'm going to deviate away from my plant based diet i would still like to minimize harm as much as possible but at the end of the day what is veganism about it is about minimizing animal suffering yeah as far as is practical minimize suffering and that is the reason why i still don't consume chickens and cows and uh, goats and and pigs so is this because of the way they are treated before they are slaughtered if it was a more humane killing would you be open to that like if you had the experiments done in front of you you can see where you're buying your chicken from you can see how well they are treated will that maybe change your perception it would be far better than how they are treated right now the animals aren't treated well at all it's so the word suffering does not do justice to what they experience in the slaughterhouse having said that though killing still constitutes an irrevocable harm yeah no animal wants to die and uh, even if it can be done painlessly it is a permanent harm to the animal so i'd still not be comfortable but i'm not opposed to that reality in the sense i feel that would be a far better outcome than what we see right now so i'm in in support of um, humane killing yeah because it would be better for the animals as opposed to how they are being uh, treated right now but the, how of, how quickly after you changed your diet did you see the changes coming within you how much time did it take for it to happen i don't see i did start feeling better but i cannot attribute feeling better to just the changes just which i made yeah because for 3 years when i was following my vegan diet and the gyms were open and the money was coming and i was doing well financially and and my fitness was up to the mark and there was, was no pandemic i was still feeling good so i cannot attribute my improvement in mental health to just uh, just the shift in the diet that was one piece of the puzzle amongst a lot of different things which i did to get better i was obviously seeking therapy taking my medication I started building a gym for myself so that i can can start training regardless of whether the government decides to impose a lockdown tomorrow or not and um, it, there were a lot of steps which were taken so i think all of them combined helped me feel better and this was just one little piece of the puzzle i guess i think not going to the gym was probably the hardest for people who are used to going to the gym right and you then saw it as an opportunity to build your gym but what about people who don't have that luxury what would you advise to them if they still want to do weights but are not able to go do you like those resistance bands do you think they can be good alternatives they are good uh, there's no doubt about it but a large benefit at least the mental health benefits which come from going to the gym come from the fact that you are stepping out in a public environment and you're speaking to people and a lot of times in the gym at least as young men we get to compete with other young yeah. men and there's like there's always this little setting which is created you're doing a 50 kilo bench press let me try and do 55 you know so that little healthy competition is there and um, i feel as every man should expose himself to a sport yeah and the gym was my sport just like football was my sport so you take away the gym and then you take away the football and that's going to be difficult having said that though in extreme times like this the resistance bands do help and making sure that from every other aspect or which every other aspect which can influence mental health make sure that that is dialed in yeah and and you should be fine it won't be ideal but you'll still do better but apart from the mental health benefits do you think it has as good physical benefits as maybe a dumbbell or would you say that there's oh, still something lacking bands are better they're better they they are most certainly better than dumbbells and this is something which uh, this was one of my debate challenges on social media as well we're going to get into debates very soon yes <laughs> uh, resistance bands are a lot better um uh, very quickly with the uh, resistance bands you can adjust the direction of force when you're working with a dumbbell gravity pulls straight down 
So if you have a resistance band, you can do exercises like lat pull downs. You can do lateral raises with a line of force coming from this side. And um, you get what I like to call a speed proof source of resistance. What I mean by that is like, for example, if I have a dumbbell, we take this box. After a while, this wants to fly away yeah. from my hand. So if I apply a lot of force, obviously I'm holding it down right now. But if I apply a lot of force, after a while, momentum is just going to take it, take it up. Because uh, it's susceptible to inertia. It's a free weight. Yeah. Bands aren't like that. So even though when you even though when you stretch the band, the tension in the band increases, the direction of force still stays the same. Whereas with the dumbbell, if I apply a lot of speed to the dumbbell, for a certain period of time, the direction of force may change. So if I'm doing a bicep curl and I apply a lot of speed at the bottom, I may experience some challenge here. But throughout the rest of the range of motion, I'm not experiencing a challenge. And if I go too fast, I may actually start experiencing a challenge to stop the dumbbell. Yeah. Which means now my elbow flexors aren't working. My elbow extensors, my triceps have to take over. So that and um, there are many other benefits to resistance bands which show. Um, which free weights cannot provide. So objectively speaking, obviously there are pros and cons to both, but objectively speaking, there are more pros to using resistance bands and they, 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 have, they are a lot better. It's just that most people aren't familiar with how to use resistance bands correctly and they just think that, oh, the tension increases or the resistance increases and that's, that's not entirely true. So that's, that's where I, I feel people people feel that resistance bands are a backup option when they're, they're actually not. So why do you think gyms are focusing on dumbbells and kettlebells more than resistance bands? It's a culture thing. It's a culture worldwide because we associate the iron with the gym. And there are some exercises which uh, are more popular in a gym environment, like your bench presses, the barbells and the dumbbells, they're staples. All a barbell and a dumbbell is is a source of force. Yeah. The resistance band is also a source of force. I have a machine at home. It's powered by a pneumatic resistance, a compressed air. That is also a source of force. You can have hydraulics. That's another source of force. But the more popular, um, culture, culturally appropriate source of force, which most of the gym population is familiar with, are these inertial sources of force, the free weights like the barbells and the dumbbells. So yeah. that free weight bias is something which exists in gym culture, which is why we use free weights. Yeah. And you've also been working on building a gym. You've built a lot of it now. So can you tell me about that process? What all are the equipments you've got? What was your thinking before it? What more you plan to get? So my only thinking was that no matter what happens, tomorrow, if the government imposes a lockdown, I'll always have my little playground, my little toy room, let's just call it. Yeah. It's entirely for me. A lot of people think that I've built a gym because it's my studio. It's not my studio. It's, it's it's a place where I wake up and it I go. It does look like a studio. Though. It's like a green colored uh, I, gym. I've, it looks like a studio. I, I've put a, put, put <laughs> in a lot of thought and effort into that space. Yeah, It's actually my living room and my dining room. Oh, that's perfect. You're spending most of your day there. Yeah, I just spend most of my day there. Yeah, I've got an office space also, but I prefer just taking my laptop, getting a small little stool and setting up my laptop in my gym space. It's, it's a, it's, it's, it's an environment which I love. And if you want to take a break, you can just work out for half an hour and that's a, yeah. great, that's a great break. Yeah, Yeah, correct. So, so what, what are the equipments you've got? So I've got pretty much everything. I've got um, a squat rack. You, it's also called a power cage. And that is a, usually a staple when you try and build a home gym. It's, it's, you usually begin with a rack. And a rack is basically a piece of apparatus wherein you can place the barbells, you can do your bench presses, squats, um, overhead presses, whatever it is you want to do, you got to pull up bar also on the yeah. parkage. Along with that, I have a deadlift platform. I've got dumbbells from 2.5 kgs to 50 kgs in 5 kg increments. Then I've obviously got flooring, which protects uh, my neighbor downstairs from all the all the, all the <laughs> weights which we which 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 fall on the floor. Obviously, it protects the floor, the marble floor on the bottom as well. Then I've got uh, an elliptical. I've got um, 
a sled. I've got a, a functional trainer, which I've been eyeing for a very long time. A lot of gyms which I built, I tried to lure the, the owners to purchase that functional trainer because it's powered by pneumatic resistance, which I was very fascinated by. No one really bought that. So when I had the funds, I decided to get that. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So can you tell me more about this functional trainer? Why were you so fascinated? Yeah, so we spoke about uh, inertial sources of force. Yeah. Right? And uh, I can't do this little experiment with you, but you can try it at home. Actually, we all, we, you, you've, you've seen it. When you stand on the scale, and if you start moving on the scale, or if you start moving up, up and down, you notice the number changing. Yeah. That same thing happens with the dumbbell. So with the dumbbell, you're holding five kilos here. But as soon as you start moving it, inertia tends to take over. Hmm. And now that you've accelerated it, if you had a scale which was measuring the weight of the dumbbell actively throughout the range of motion, you notice that as you're moving concentrically, as you're moving the dumbbell up, the dumbbell becomes lighter. And as you come down, the dumbbell becomes heavier. Yeah. It's like, if you were to jump on the scale right now, you may weigh 80 kilos, but if you jump, you're going to get like a big 90 kilo reading. And the same way if you were to just lift a, lift a little weight off or just jump up, you you may notice that you start weighing a little lighter. So that kind of happens with the dumbbell as well. So you got 5 kgs, but it's not really 5 kgs once you start moving. It. Yeah. And uh, the degree to which it varies depends on how fast you're moving it. So it's not a constant source of force. The magnitude keeps changing. Okay, then how do you solve this problem? Assuming it's a problem, firstly. Yeah. You can use bands. But with bands, the force increases because the tension increases. You don't have those inertial effects. So no matter how fast you move the band, if, it's, if it shows me a 5 kg reading here, it's going to show me a 7 kg reading here, no matter what speed I pull the band. Yeah. But it still shows me 7 kgs here. I want 5 here and I want 5 here. So the solution which uh, Dennis Kaiser came up with, and that, that's the reason why this functional trainer is called the Kaiser, the Kaiser functional trainer. He decided to use compressed air as a source of force, as a source of resistance. And that essentially makes this functional trainer speed proof. So you set your resistance, let's say it's five kilos, and then you can pull at whatever speed you want. And no matter what speed you pull at, it's going to be five here, five here, five here. And why it's uh, better, or instead of saying better, why it's perhaps more unique as, a, as, a, as an equipment is because there are certain times when we want to perform movements fast, but we don't want the direction of force to change with the free weight. Like, for example, if you were to use a traditional cable station yeah. and you grip the handle and you set, set it 10 kgs and you pull it as fast as possible, what's going to happen? That, that Those plates are going to go flying up and then they're going to come crashing down. So you're not going to get 10 kilos throughout and that direction of force may change if you pull, pull too fast. So you can't really do speed work. And that's what you can experience on a Kaiser. The Kaiser is basically inertia proof. And you can do a lot of speed work. And as someone who's always been interested in speed and football and athletics. And um, but that's it. That's that's the reason why I always had my eye on the Kaiser. And that's why that's why that's why I got it for myself. So are more gyms coming up with that now? Is there more awareness in the industry about it? Not really. Why do you think that's the case? Are because they too resistant to change? Are they too used to because how, things the old how, I, how the, the, the question is, how are you going to communicate to the consumer that this is better? Hmm. So outright, you can just say it's better. Yeah. But uh, at the moment you get into the technical aspects, they might not, they might not see eye to eye. With yeah. You. Um, a gym which has a traditional functional trainer, which may be priced at anywhere between 50,000 to a lakh. Yeah. For the average consumer, the average gym goer, that is the same piece of equipment as the Kaiser, which is a lot more expensive. So then the gym owners also kind of think about it, right? Like, why should I put, why should I spend so much money when it's not even going to be appreciated? Yeah. Plus, there's a separate compressor which comes with the Kaiser. Like, how do you fill air? You got a compressor that that makes noise. You need some electricity now. And I also think that a lot of um, 
gym owners don't know that there are different sources of force. This whole perspective of viewing exercise as applying force to the body. It's not something which people are familiar with. We view exercise as, you know, this little recipe, um, this little choreography, which we have to do. We have to do the bench press. We have to have a bar in our hands and come down and press up. Yeah. So that is, that is where the industry is when it comes to their education when, as far as exercise is concerned. Maybe as uh, there is more education and there's more awareness and people recognize, oh, wow, there are more sources of force which have unique benefits to offer. Perhaps then these other sources of force will become more popular. So I think that's where you come in, right? You offer something unique that other people don't. And that's probably helped you stand out in the industry as well. I'd like to believe so. Yeah. And also apart from the exercises, you also focus a lot on the nutrition, nutritional aspect of it. So can you tell me a bit about like you were into veganism, then you stopped. So if someone wants to build, but they are not getting their source of protein from non-veg, how would you recommend that? And you yourself, I think you were lactose intolerant, you still are? Yes, yes. Yeah, so how do you battle, how do you combat all these challenges? Right, so uh, just to preface this, I followed a plant-based diet for one reason and one reason only, and that was ethics. Yeah. There's no other reason, reason there's no health benefit to following a plant-based diet. In fact, there are health challenges or rather optimization challenges when you get rid of a lot of animal-based foods from your diet. So you're going to either have to supplement with them or very carefully plan your diet to make sure that you don't develop any deficiencies or insufficiencies. So now if someone wants to follow a plant-based diet and they also happen to be lactose intolerant, the reality is, is that it's going to be difficult for them to meet their protein requirements. There are some sources of protein which... People tend to view as sources of protein, but honest to goodness, they aren't. Like legumes, for example, the predominant macronutrient in legumes, most legumes, is carbohydrate. And yes, there's a little protein which comes along with it. But the quality of that protein isn't up to the mark. So that, that doesn't mean that you don't get any protein from it. It still counts. But it's not the best source of protein out there. And it most certainly does not compete with the animal sources of protein. We do have protein powder. You've got plant-based protein powders, which people can rely on. I still don't think we are at a stage in technology wherein we can extract plant-based protein powders without some potential downsides or some potential toxins creeping in, which is why I'm not a big fan of plant-based protein powders. In fact, I'm not a big fan of using protein powders in general. I, I'm more, more of an advocate of using food, and that's largely because of the quality control issues with yeah. protein powders. But um, yeah, you're pretty much then left with protein powder and um, trying to extract some protein which comes along with the carbohydrate and fat sources in a vegetarian diet. But the good news here is we don't require a lot of protein. A lot of people think we need a lot of protein to build muscle. You don't require much. So as long as you're physically active, as long as you have the ability to consume a lot of food, and you supplement your diet with some some protein, you should be fine even on a plant-based diet. And was there any specific amount of proteins you used to calculate in every meal when you were building your, like what was the number? Yeah, so I used to aim for about 20 to 30 grams of protein in each meal. And the reason for that is, it seems that 20 to 30 grams of protein gives you about two to three grams of leucine. Now, Leucine is an amino acid and protein is basically a chain of amino acids. Amino acids are basically the building blocks of protein. And this 2 to 3 grams of, pro of, of leucine, which is found in protein, seems to help maximize the muscle building process or muscle protein synthesis. So if you get about 20 to 30 grams of protein, you'll get about 2 to 3 grams of leucine. And uh, you want to space those doses of protein about three to five hours apart. So that's the whole idea behind consuming four meals a day and more specifically getting four boluses of protein, four to, four to five boluses of protein in the day. So yes, back in the day, I, I, I had my diet very carefully planned. Now my goals have uh, changed a bit. I still want to be jacked and fit, but with my other endeavors in business and and finance, and I think you, everyone reaches an age where 
fitness isn't their primary goal anymore. Yeah. You still want to be physically fit. It's still very important. But food tends to come in the way. So now I don't, uh, I still make sure that I get enough protein in the day. But I don't very carefully space out the protein. Okay. I still want to change that though, to be honest with you. I still want to challenge myself to continue working and getting my servings of protein in the day as well. But yes, I don't, I, I don't plan my diet as carefully as I used to once upon a time. And what do you think about people that are just on carnivorous diets? Is They're, that sustainable in the long run? See, so I, I don't like the word sustainable too much. Because sustainable can be anything which you, which you want to adhere to. For example, I follow a very restrictive diet. My only sources of carbohydrate are uh, fruit and, and rice. For the most part. And, and that's because I realized that fruit and right, rice are very easy for me to digest. And I, I would like to feel energetic and I wouldn't want to ha experience bloating or lethargy of, of, of any sort whatsoever. Um, so you may think, you may ask yourself whether that's sustainable, but it's entirely sustainable for me. I have no problem following a rice and fruit based diet or at least a rice and fruit based carbohydrate rice and fruit based carbohydrate sources to to meet my energy requirements so i'm not a big fan of sustainable because there's this idea which is created that in order to follow a diet correctly you need to have some wiggle room in the diet or 20% of your calories should come from junk food or foods which you enjoy the taste of that's just made up there is no, nothing in the literature to suggest that adherence gets affected if you follow a very strict strict diet. If anything, we find that adherence is better. I mean, think about it. If you are following a diet which requires you to consume a few select foods, what is going to happen? Over time, your palate is going to change. And your taste buds will just be familiar with those foods and those foods alone. So an example which I like to use is Domino's Pizza. If you do not know what Domino's pizza tastes like, you cannot crave Domino's pizza. Yeah. As soon as you know what Domino's pizza tastes like, as soon as you've had a slice, now you think to yourself, wow, man, this tastes really good. I would like to eat more of it. Now, I haven't had Domino's pizza in a really long time. And by virtue of not having Domino's pizza for a really long time, I kind of don't remember how it tastes and I most certainly do not crave it. Yeah. But if I were to have a slice today, it would be difficult for me not to have a slice tomorrow and day after tomorrow because now I'm familiar. Yeah. And that familiarity is what then gravitates me towards consuming more of that uh, that food which uh, which does more harm than good. So are you completely off junk food now? Yes. I, As far as is possible, I don't consume any junk food. So whenever you're out with the boys, what is it that you eat? So there are options. So steamed rice is something you always get. And I almost always ask the server to speak to the chef and make me either like an egg rice preparation or some some seafood curry with, with rice. That's what I have. Okay. Sushi is another thing which I enjoy. South Indian food, the, most of that is rice-based, Italy's yeah. dosas. So there are options, but again, I'm, I try and be as disciplined as possible. So that's good. But you feel that you're not uh, uh, lacking in any place if you're just having rice and all those things you feel you're getting your nutrition yes yes I of course the rest of my diet is very carefully curated to make sure that I don't have don't develop any deficiency or insufficiency and wherever I do identify a vitamin or mineral which I'm not getting enough of then I'll supplement with that and what do you think about soy you had some really strong opinions on soy uh, before you get to soy <laughs> we'll just quick, very quickly come back to the carnivore oh, yeah. uh, topic because we weren't able to address that so the thing with the carnivore diet is it's not a great way of eating for most people because you're going to firstly you're, you're going to lose the ability to metabolize carbohydrate because a strict carnivore diet is basically a carbohydrate free diet it's, it's essentially a ketogenic diet without vegetables so whilst you can meet your vitamins vitamin and mineral targets on a carnivore diet you can consume organs and get most of your vitamins and minerals still not advisable to consume a car car carnivore diet. Having said that though, you can't dismiss it entirely because a lot of 
people who suffer from autoimmune conditions, whether it's a severe form of arthritis or anything of that sort, they benefit greatly from a strict elimination diet, which resembles a carnivore diet. So a lot of people have seen great changes. Um, their lives have changed on a carnivore type diet. But the reason their life has changed is not because there's something special about the meat. Okay. But rather, the compounds which they were either intolerant to or allergic to or uh, which their bodies were not responding to well. They got rid of those. And usually those are the compounds which are found in vegetables, plant defense chemicals, the anti-nutrients. And now that we are moving on to soy, we'll get a chance to speak more about them. But before we get to soy, did you follow the story of the liver king? The latest story wherein he got busted for yeah. steroid use? Yeah. Yes. So what was your take about him initially when he was just saying that uh, everyone, all, everyone knew it? Everyone, ev everyone knew. Everyone who's reasonably familiar with what it is possible to achieve as far as muscle growth is concerned, everyone knew he was on steroids. It's just that he claimed to be natural. Because it's better to claim that you're natural. Because as soon as you say that you use steroids and people will... will um, they won't acknowledge the hard work which you're putting in as far as training and nutrition. But even after steroids, there's a lot of hard work, right? You just can't take steroids and get that naturally. You still have to work hard for it. That's not entirely true. Steroids make life very easy for you. In but, fact, there's a very cool study done in the 90s by ba Bazin and colleagues. They had four groups, but I'll just cut to the chase and tell you what they showed. They essentially showed that uh, if you take steroids and you don't exercise, you sit at home and chill, chill on the couch, you build more muscle than people who do not take steroids and go to the gym and exercise. So steroids are incredibly powerful. And in today's age, it's not just a few steroids. There are many different types of testosterone der derivatives which people use. Plus, they use other hormones as well, like growth hormone and insulin and things like that. So, and the liver king was on a, was on a large cocktail of a lot yeah. of different compounds. So, that's the reason why people don't want to admit to steroid use. Also, it's not healthy. People die. Bodybuilders die. It's uh, it's not. It's it's definitely not something you'd associate with someone who's um, who's uh, sharing the fitness message, the health message. And one one more reason why you don't want to you don't want to claim that you're using steroids is because then sponsorships go. Like, for example, if a supplement company wants to sponsor an athlete, they want to then show people that this athlete is taking my supplement and that is why he's big and strong. But as soon as people find out, wait a second, he's using steroids. Yeah. He's not big and strong because of your special supplement. He's big and strong because of the steroids. Then there's the motivation for a supplement company to sponsor you also reduces. So I, I'm not sure if the Liver King was sponsored. I think he was selling some he was selling his own course. He had a lot of sponsorships as well. So yeah, he had his own yeah. supplements. He wanted pe people yeah. to believe that, you know, it's my special organ supplements which help me become all big and strong. And does eating the liver actually help? It's a good source of vitamins. But it can't be the only source. It's not the only source. Yeah, and it can't. Like, you wouldn't advise it for anybody. It's fine if, uh, if, if you're comfortable consuming liver. It's a very healthy source of vitamins. And you get uh, these vitamins without the plant defense chemicals which you get from consuming those vitamins from vegetables, perhaps. So, liver is very healthy. You just want to make sure that you consume a small amount of liver, not too much, yeah. because you can overdose on certain vitamins. And you balance it out with other things as well. Yes. Yeah. And what do you think about, now let's come back to soy. So, you have some really strong opinions on it. Can you first tell me your take on soy? And Right. So, so I, I have an interesting journey with soy. I started off as a soy supporter. I was pro-soy. And then as I became more familiar with the literature on soy, I realized that soy has some problems. And uh, that's it. I've had a lot of debates online. I've had two debates. I got paid for winning one of the debates. Then I recently had a debate with... Um, a PhD scholar from Chandigarh. 
And of course, those internet shen shenanigans are still going on with the pro-soy community. And I'm standing my ground here with, with, um, with my anti-soy message. So can you tell me the both sides of it? Like what was the PhD guy saying? Yeah, What's so, your take on so if, you, if, you, if you navigate through the scientific literature on soy, you'll come across studies which show that soy isn't all that bad. So what are some of the popular concerns with soy? One is the phytoestrogen argument that soy is a source of phytoestrogens. If you consume these phytoestrogens, then you're going to essentially lose your manhood. Your, your estrogen levels will go up. Your testosterone will go down. But if you go through the scientific literature, it seems that that's not entirely true. There are a lot of randomized control trials and even reviews which show that soy isn't all that bad for hormonal health. And that has led the scientific community to believe that soy is safe to consume. But we can't just look at one side of the equation. It's, it's true that there is a lot of pro-soy literature, but it's balanced with a lot of anti-soy literature as well. So that is the literature which I'm appealing to. What I'm essentially asking the entire nutrition industry to identify is that, okay, I accept you got your pro-soy literature. But why do we have all these bad apples then? Why do we have studies which show that a measly 30 grams of soybeans, pickled soybeans, can wreak havoc when it comes to thyroid function? This is with regards to a paper which got popular with my debates recently, Ishizuki 91. It's 30 grams of soybeans. And the participants started developing hypothyroidism, goiters, and a lot more with regards to thyroid dysfunction. We got other studies which show that the placebo group does better than the soy group when it comes to building muscle. Obviously, we got a lot of studies which show that there's hormone disruption which happens with, with consuming soy. And uh, then when you go through the entirety of the literature, you go to, to the history of the literature and how this positive literature came to be you realize there's a lot of industry funding at play. So for example, a lot of this pro-soy literature, there's one gentleman who is orchestrating this entire pro-soy literature. His name is Mark Messina. He's a spokesperson for the soy industry. And there are a lot of companies who seek to benefit from promoting soy products. So I'm not saying that just because the study is funded, that means that we should dismiss it entirely. But when we see study after study, from Mark Messina and his colleagues with a clear industry funding bias. And as soon as you get rid of that industry funding bias, all we are left with are the bad apples. Yeah. You need to think to yourself, maybe it's best if I stay away from this. So the people product. you debate, what, what is their counter argument? Their co counter argument is the popular evidence-based narrative. Look, there was a recent review which showed that soy isn't um, disruptive of hormonal health. So they'll appeal to the latest 2019 review and there was another one published last year, 2021. And they think that just because there's a review or a meta-analysis which shows that a certain food is safe to consume, that means that that is a narrative we need to go ahead with. So they cherry pick a few studies yeah. and they ignore a mountain of literature which completely counters their claims. And the main thing is the thing behind the literature, right? Who's funding it and do they have an additional motive which most people are not aware of? Yeah. So I think that's one of the main reasons why it's so prevalent. So given these concerns with soy, what alternatives would you recommend to people? That's a good question. And honest to goodness, as far as plant-based uh, options are concerned, you don't have a lot of alternatives because soy, as problematic as it is, as far as legumes are concerned, it still has the highest concentration of protein amongst all the legumes. And also the different uh, plants that we have access to from which we can derive protein. So perhaps uh, one thing which we can do is use other legumes which um, aren't as problematic as soy, which have a better track record as soy. We have to make sure they're well cooked. But uh, the honest to goodness truth here is you're going to have to either supplement with a plant-based protein powder or if you're comfortable, which I guess most people in our country are comfortable consuming some dairy and eggs, even the ones who are vegetarian. We are mostly lacto-vegetarians. 
and some of us are lacto and over vegetarians. So fermented dairy products, which are easy to digest, and uh, eggs, these are your two best options. And uh, if someone isn't following any form of restriction, then they can largely meet almost all their nutrition requirements from just food alone, as long as their diet is nutritionally adequate. Yeah. You don't need to supplement. Perhaps the only supplement which almost everyone needs to consider is vitamin D. Vitamin J. D. D. Yeah. D. The sun, the, the one you get from sunlight. The one we get from sunlight. Yeah. But unfortunately, we don't get a lot of sun exposure. And even if we do, we don't get a lot of full body sun exposure. Yeah. There are some sources of food as well, but um, it's best if you don't rely on those and just supplement with vitamin D. It's a very common deficiency. But outside of that, you can pretty much meet all your vitamin and mineral requirements from food alone, provided you aren't following any restrictions per se. If you're going to follow a plant-based diet, a vegetarian diet, then in all likelihood, you're going to have to consume more supplements. And that should be fine. Yeah. The mindset which you should have when it comes to supplements is that uh, at the end of the day, our body does not know we're consuming food. It's more interested in deriving the chemical compounds which are present in the food. For example, glucose has a chemical structure. It has a carbon backbone and we've got hydrogen and oxygen atoms bonded to it. That's a chemical. Protein is a chemical. Fatty acids are chemicals. And uh, food is a way wherein we are able to derive these chemicals in a quote-unquote more natural way. But if for whatever reason, we are not able to derive all the chemicals or all the compounds we need, we should be open to supplementation because at the end of the day, whether we derive a certain chemical structure from food or from a supplement, as long as the chemical structure is the same, the body does not know the difference. So that is one way I encourage my clients to consider supplementation if they have that little naturalistic fallacy bias that, oh, I don't want to consume supplements because I want to follow a more natural diet. Yeah. So that d does tend to come about. But uh, this is one way I've found to address this argument and uh, encourage people to consider supplements too. And I would say I have a vitamin D deficiency as well because I hardly go out when it's bright outside. I'm a more of a night person. So what would you tell me? Like, how should I get the most out of it? How should I supplement my vitamin D? I have a lot of milk, I have eggs, but apart from that, what else do you think I should have? The easiest thing you can do is supplement with vitamin D. So, the first thing you may want to start with is getting blood work done and identifying the extent of your deficiency or insufficiency. And that is then going to decide whether you should start with a maintenance dose which you can have every single day. Or if you've got a very severe deficiency or insufficiency, you may want to do a bolus dose once a week okay. for a certain duration of time. And that duration is going to depend on your current levels. If your levels are very low, you may have to do that bolus dose per week for about eight weeks. Uh, if it's an even more severe deficiency, you may have to do it for 12 weeks. Once you get to that sufficiency range, then you should just take a maintenance dose every single day. So that's going to work out to be about a thousand international units every single day for most people. And it's very easy to get a thousand international units. You just have to go to the medical store. And uh, there are a few companies which sell you those thousand international unit units, gelatin capsules, which you can consider. But is this an ongoing process after the amount of time or it yeah. has to be a lifelong thing? It's a lifelong thing. The way you want to think about, the way you want to think about supplements is it's food in a convenient form factor. Okay. As soon as you change that mindset and as soon as you start looking at a supplement as just something you need it's healthier to supplement with vitamin d than to develop a vitamin d deficiency yeah and because it's not convenient to get vitamin d from sunlight there are downsides also to you know just sun exposure for ex extended periods of time a vitamin d supplement should just become part of your diet it's just something you consume every single day just like you consume water every single day just like you have your different meals every single day. Your vitamin D supplement should just become a staple in your diet. And what is the ideal quantity of water you recommend to have every day? For most people, it's going to be somewhere between that two and a half to five liter ballpark. But uh, of course, it's going to depend on how much you sweat, how physically active you are. 
But for most people, it's about 2.5 to 5 liters. And would you say that's excluding milk? That's a very good question because yeah. you need to consider the fluids which you're getting from fruit and foods like, let's say, curries and yeah. dals and milk. You can consider those as well. If you're having a lot of liquid-based food items, you can consider those as well. And um, the one little um, tip, which practical piece of advice I can give you here is you want to make sure that uh, the color of your urine isn't a very dark yellow. Yeah. As long as that's that's not happening, you've got a pale yellow or a wh white white color. Is white healthy? Because I've read somewhere that it's your over, uh, I mean, that's putting also, too much fluid in your body. That is also a reality. That's another very yeah. good question. And without, you know, getting into the technicalities of of, of this entire electrolyte and water discussion, we won't be able to address it completely. But yeah, you, if, if you're, you shouldn't be drinking too much water. Because after, uh, beyond a certain point, you're not just going to lose water, you're also going to lose electrolytes and yeah. certain other other minerals which you which you don't want your body to get depleted by. So yeah, but as long as you're under that five liter mark, you should be fine. If it's if it's under five liters and you're you're getting a nice white consistently, you the and of course you're following a nutritionally adequate diet. Yeah. You're not going to have any the the potential for losing minerals to the extent that they'll become problematic for your health. That in all likelihood won't happen. And before we touch on Jitendra Choksi, I just wanted to ask you, well, get ready for that. <laughs> mm. I just wanted to ask you that, what do you think are the common uh, injuries that people encounter in the gym and what's the best way to avoid it? Apart from just, you know, doing the right stance, is it their warm up, their cool down, what, what leads to it? More often than not, injuries in the gym stem from poor exercise selection and taking your joints in a position where they're just, just not meant to be be in that position or they are not meant to move that way. For example, my elbow is a hinge joint. Okay. This is how it moves. Yeah. Okay. Just like the door here, it's, it's a hinge. I can't move it laterally. I can't apply forces like this and expect my elbow to tolerate that. And unfortunately, most people who don't know don't have any idea about how to perform exercise correctly. And unfortunately, this also stems from, or rather we, we see this also from a lot of trainers who tend to recommend exercises which disrespect your, your joint structure. Uh, that's where a lot of people end up hurting themselves. So if you're just careful with our exercise selection and we respect our natural available range of motion, for example, there are some people who just can't bring their arms overhead. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself, why can't they bring their arms overhead? You can't look inside the joint and, and and find out why. Perhaps there's a structural limitation which you have to respect. So, so that's it. Whatever comfortable available range you have, work with that and select exercises which which respect your joints and don't force your joints into position which um, which can become hurtful. Another thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, would you prioritize more weight over more reps? Because there are people who go for one lift, two lifts, and they are doing really heavy weights, and they're not able to do eight, ten reps about one exercise. So what do you think is the ideal thing? Because I've heard both sides of it, and I see the benefits of both sides, but I wanted to get an expert's view on it. Yeah, so you need to ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to become a power lifter? Are you trying to become a weight lifter? Are you trying to build muscle? Because the currency of muscle growth, as far as the stimulus is concerned, which the body recognizes to initiate muscle growth, that's just the force which the muscle produces. So like we discussed in the beginning of uh, our discussion that when we exercise, we basically challenge our body with an external source of force. Yeah. Okay, the dumbbell is what? It's just a source of force. And our muscles have to produce a force in response to that source of force. Now, that force which the muscle produces has a name. It's tension. In the scientific literature, it's called mechanical tension. So, the greater the amount of mechanical tension that a muscle produces, 
the greater the demands imposed on the body and then the body recognizes okay muscle really needs to produce a lot of force let's let's help the muscle out a bit and increase its potential to produce force and that's how the muscle grows it's an, it's essentially an adaptation yeah to a stress so it's not required for us to lift heavy weights and um, in the quest of not making this an over overly technical discussion i'd say generally speaking i mean you can get into the technicals because i'm sure most people who are oh, yes. keen on this here if if we sure no problem so technically speaking then you have to ask yourself okay if i'm going to lift very heavy weight then what's going to happen perhaps i do one to two repetitions i got a lot of weight so i can lift for one to two repetitions the gym is impressed and i'm working on becoming stronger yeah what's the muscle going to recognize now the magnitude of force which the muscle is going to produce at that point in time is going to be very large but because i'm only able to do one to two reps the time during which i will experience that tension is going to be less so yes i'm producing a lot of force but not for a for a large amount of time which means that i may in all likelihood have to perform more sets to not just get a lot of tension but also get a lot of tension for a certain amount of time so yes you can build muscle that way you have to be careful because the amount of load you lift or the heaviness of the the load which you choose is going to in all likelihood put you at an increased risk of injury but as long as you are careful in that regard you can can train heavy as well but in all likelihood for you to get that stimulus you're going to have to perform more sets yeah and you may have to spend more time in the gym to get that uh, hypertrophic stimulus that muscle grow- growth stimulus so if you have to think about wh- why do most people go to the gym they go to the gym to build muscle to look good we can then decide that okay fine we our muscles need to produce tension they need to produce force and they also need to produce tension for a certain amount of time if i pick a higher rep set i'm still producing a lot of force maybe i'm doing about 8 to 15 reps and i'm getting about 60 seconds of tension production by the muscle i may not have to do as many sets and i may not have to expose myself to a very large load yeah and i'll be able to get that muscle growth stimulus more safely and more efficiently so that's why generally speaking that 8 to 25 rep range obviously depending on the exercise some exercises are more conducive to a higher rep range some exercises are more conducive to a lower rep range but that 8 to 25 ish rep range is what you want to aim for but of course there are some people who like lifting heavy and in that case they just have to do more sets to get a uh, a hypertrophic stimulus or they can do the heavy set and then they can strip off some weight and do some more repetitions with lighter weights and also scientifically it's recommended that you need between 6 and 8 hours of sleep and right. then you famously say that sleep is for the weak <laughs> did so, i say that yeah, have i, I think said you that did. you said a lot of things that you regret <laughs> no i don't regret anything <laughs> so what's your take on sleep because i see you working out at odd hours you're yeah. up up till 2 in the night you're up at 6 in the morning so i really don't know when you sleep do you ever sleep is aman the girl human i think it's time to ask that oh that's uh, <laughs> so the way i like to think about sleep is i don't have any other bad habits i follow very clean diet i exercise almost every single day i do my work no recreational drugs or anything of that sort and uh, i live an interesting life i almost always have something or another to do yeah and even my home environment if you see there there are boys around they're working out at odd hours and if they are around i'd rather be with them watch perhaps football games and pass my time that way than rest so so i ha- i don't have a very good relationship with my sleep schedule and uh, it's it's reached a stage where i where i don't count how many hours i sleep as long as i'm not fatigued and i'm feeling energetic yeah i won't sleep and uh, 
now it's reached a stage where I'm, I guess I get a few hours of sleep once every two days or so. That's it, just a few hours? Just a few hours, yeah. Okay. So, I'll, 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 I'll give you an example. The last time I slept was from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. yesterday. Okay. So, from 9 p.m. to now, I've been up, wide awake. Wow, you don't look that. You look fresh as ever. Yeah, I guess I've, I'm used to it now. But again, it's not, it's not healthy. The question we it need to ask yet. ourselves is, okay, I'm able to do this and get away with it. However, if I get a more consistent sleep schedule and if I sleep for six to eight hours a day, I'm feeling great now. Yeah. But can I feel even better? And I think the answer to that question is yes, I can do a lot better if I sleep um, or rather respect my sleep schedule. I just... Um, I'm 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 in a phase of life where sleeping isn't very it 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 does not align well with my personality right now. You feel it a waste of time. It I feel like it's a it's a waste of time. I feel feel like it's not what a soldier would do. And um, part of what I speak about, at least my students are familiar with this. I encourage at least every young man to spend at least two to three years in their life living like a soldier because the new 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 age world the modern environment does not impose a lot of stressors upon the young man and yeah. we, we aren't forced to adopt a disciplined lifestyle so though those uh, so so from that mindset from a soldier's mindset i feel that i'd rather not sleep and rather coach myself to get away with uh, not sleeping for extended periods of time but again i think in in a few years from now, I, sh I, I, I should correct that and, yeah. and start sleeping more, more, more consistently. But have there been any influences on you that have made you this way, living the soldier life? Is there anyone you look up to? It's, it's my depression and anxiety. So, I've struggled with mental health um, for about five years. Obviously, though, my mental health struggles peaked during the pandemic. Yeah. But I think from... 2016 to 2020, I was in therapy and I was on prescription medication. On and off, obviously, there were phases in my life where the depression and anxiety would peak and then I'd have phases where I'd feel feel better. But I really wanted to find like a permanent solution to this issue. And one of the things which I really struggled with while I was experiencing depression and anxiety was sleep. Either I was sleeping too much when I was severely depressed or when I was anxious, I couldn't sleep yeah. much. So, over the years, my mindset towards depression and anxiety have changed. I look at them more as uh, these um, natural triggers, these biological triggers which help me understand what I'm supposed to do. Like, for example, if I, if I feel depressed for whatever reason, I'm immediately able to identify why I'm feeling depressed. Perhaps I'm spending a lot of time in bed. Yeah. And uh, I shouldn't be doing that. I should be exercising or working. If I'm feeling anxious, there's definitely something which is making me feel anxious, which I should be addressing. So that's that's how my whole, let's just say, toxically masculine avatar came to be. I just decided that uh, I need to become mentally stronger. I recognize that large reason why I experience these depression and anxiety-based episodes. I experienced them. But a lot of my friends who perhaps had harsher backgrounds, they were not experiencing them. And of course, I'm, I was working with athletes and some of these athletes were absolute tanks. Yeah. Um, one, of my, one of my athletes I worked with, he, 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 he came from a very harsh environment and he was still imposed to a lot of stressors and he would just take everything on the chin and move forward. So it got me thinking that just like there is something to be said about becoming physically stronger and we impose stress upon our body and by imposing those stressors, we become physically stronger. That same thing must apply to mental strength as well. So I just continued to challenge myself in whatever way possible. That's why you see me embroiled in these <laughs> debates. debates and controversies because debates aren't pleasant. Yeah. It's a, it's a competition. It's a challenge. Your authority is on the line. Your expertise is on the line. So, I'd rather it be that way. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I feel my, my best self when there's some, some competition or challenge happening. 
so so yeah oh, that's that's how the my relationship with sleep got a little skewed yeah, I, i just felt that i wasted too much time sleeping and focusing on sleeping and for whatever reason i don't feel sleepy there must be a good reason for it i'm not tired yeah and if i'm not tired i might as well work or exercise or do something instead of sleeping so i let my body decide when it needs rest and if it needs rest i'm going to give it rest so that's that's what what my relationship with sleep is like right now okay. and speaking of debates i think it's time we bring up the infamous jitendra choksi so before uh, telling us the details about it can you just explain to the viewer who he is in the first place and what led to the feud so i'm not very motivated to speak about him because i want us to goodness don't think he's worth my time but uh, you are someone who reached out to me back in 2015 and in 2015 me and my colleagues we made a video a physics breakdown of the bench press and he challenged our physics calculations then and we spent a lot of time on the phone explaining to him our physics calculations first he obviously attacked us on facebook and uh, we made an attempt to help him understand what it is we are trying to do in that video from there he apologized which i have to give him credit for he issued a public apology said he was in the wrong then he offered me a job not a job a partnership in his company squats which is now fitro and essentially he wanted me to create his academy and be the the person who is handling the educational aspect of uh, what he is doing right now i rejected i said uh, i don't see eye to eye with a lot of what you do and uh, i don't trust you after that little episode we had and after that he got bitter he made a few statements i made a video about this entire episode and that episode passed fast forward to 2021 there was another debate like situation which came about he showed up he had a debate with me i comfortably won that debate i comfortably won that debate to the extent that he went out of his way to get those videos deleted and in the course of that debate he said a lot of things or rather he made up a lot of lies about me and in response to those lies i attacked him back you've seen the drama which has unfolded no, socially okay. and uh, he got upset he filed a defamation suit against me which is fine and uh, from there when he realized that the defamation suit isn't uh, bringing him the results which he thought he would he would get from filing that defamation suit he made up a story about me extorting him for 7 crore rupees so this is in reference to something you had said on your instagram story which he took out of context yeah so there was a little business and marketing webinar which i was trying to promote at that time it was a free video which yeah. i was doing with another one of my friends so he was hosting the video and in order to promote that video or to promote that live session i said that i'm going to teach all of you at the end of this webinar i'm going to teach you how to make 4 crore rupees yeah so that was obviously a little bait and then after that entire thing uh, got over i picked on jitendra chokes after that whole debate everyone was picking on him so that's where you know in jest we spoke about 4 crore rupees and how i want it and why i want it and obviously it was said in jest and he just used that and created a little story and falsely accused me of uh, extorting him for 4 crores when that wasn't really my intention and uh, of course the judges have recognized that the police have recognized that they've done their due diligence and that's the reason i got granted anticipatory bail we've got other fully grown up men <laughs> who are accusing other men in the same industry as they are of um, false crimes which uh, which is which is a very cowardly thing to do at the end of it our disagreements are on a technical level at an academic level i didn't know him yeah he's the one who reached out to me instead of 
speaking to me and perhaps debating me academically. He's resorted to these pressure tactics, but that's absolutely fine. But where were your disagreements initially? What led to the feud? The disagreement started with these physics um, calculations yeah. which we had come up with. After we saw, we resolved those uh, disagreements for him, or rather we helped him understand why our calculations were correct and his comments weren't. He started picking on some of my nutrition information, some of my other exercise information. Long story short, I helped him understand where we are coming from. And he recognized that too. See, the reason he asked me to handle his educational endeavor was that he recognized the fact that I and my team are more technically capable. Yeah. And uh, I think what hurt him was the fact that we didn't decide to work with him. And uh, that is something his ego couldn't handle. And I also feel he he's bitter about the fact that there are people who are more academically inclined, far smarter than him. In the debate, I was easily able to outwit him within the first five minutes. So that's 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 what makes him bitter. He, he does not like me because I've got the better of him every time we've interacted on social media. So currently, where are we at? You're on anticipatory bail. What's next? So with regards to the extortion situation, I've been granted anticipatory bail. The police is doing their due diligence. So the courts will do their due dil diligence. We got the defamatory suit happening in Delhi. And, and that's about it. I've got a very good legal team, the finest legal team in India. And they're doing a fantastic job with, um, with my defense. So it's business as usual for me. This is just a little hiccup which he was trying to create. But... Uh, we are just trying to help the courts understand that we are not in the wrong. This is the guy who came. He, he engaged with us and uh, all we did was responded to his engagement. But do you think you've learned any lessons maybe to be a bit careful with your words or you think you're, you're, you're the same after it? Well, because there are things you said out of context that have been taken. Of course, literally, yeah. of course, of course. I, um, I do understand that. Uh, you want to choose your words carefully on social media. And in hindsight, I think for every decision you take or everything you say or do, if you were to view it in hindsight, you may consider doing it differently. Yeah. But I do not regret anything. There are many things which I do differently based on what I understand now. But I don't, don't regret any bit of it. And uh, I will defend it and I will defend it well. My legal team is going to help us form, formulate a good defense, which they're already doing, by the way. They're yeah. doing a fantastic job. And we're very confident about our case here. So that's where we're at. And uh, no regrets here. He m cooked up a lot of lies about me. This entire extortion situation was a blatant lie. And I feel if someone is going to lie about you, then there is no reason for you to hold regrets about it. Um, if someone wants to create unnecessary trouble for you, then you should be able to stand up and defend yourself. Absolutely. I think initially, what, what do you think he planned to scare you off? Yeah, the... that's it. He, he thought that he's going to send me a legal notice and I'm going to get scared. And that's not going to happen with someone like me. Yeah. One of the first orders they passed was to ask him to make an apology. Yeah. So, he's essentially just been losing to me repeatedly. If you... If you were to see this entire situation from 2015 to now, he's just gone from one loss to the next and he's trying to get his win in some way, shape or form. At the end of the day, it's an ego, ego war. Yeah. He's a man of resources. I'm also a man of resources. He's willing to spend some money to, to bother me. I'm willing to spend some money to defend myself. So that, that's all it is. It's two men in the industry. One man has consistently got the better of the other man here. And his ego has reached that breaking point to the extent that he's resorted to fabricating lies about me. Asked you for another debate in the recent past? He, I can give this to you in writing, he will never, ever show up for a debate with me. Because the two debates which he's had with me, both on the phone when uh, that happened in 2015 and the one which we had here, uh, the Zomato debate, they haven't lasted long. He, he doesn't have the capability to debate me. He's not smart. He's not well-read. So, 
And he knows that. He knows I'm far better than him. And that's what bothers him deeply. So he's never going to debate me. He keeps making up a few stories indirectly referring to me, you know, with regards to the soy situation. He, he made, made a few stories recently. But uh, that's the extent to what he, he can do. I think it's grade A cowardice. If you disagree with someone, yeah. the least you can do is engage in that disagreement and debate that person. And I think the best way to resolve these conflicts is to discuss it in person rather than getting legal teams involved and all of that. It is so foolish for a, for a man like him who has a family, who's got a daughter, to just uh, engage in these situations. Firstly, engage in foul language, engage in these back, back and forths, and then make these matters legal. It's just irresponsible, childish behavior. So, I don't understand where he's coming from. And uh, I think he can be grateful to me because I'm, I've am i been a thorough gentleman in this entire endeavor. And I've never threatened him or done anything wrong or even considered doing anything of that sort. But I do understand that a lot of people in my place would, uh, would be incredibly angered by the situation. Why would you want to make enemies and anger someone? Yeah. It's just foolish. So he wants to act in foolish ways. It's fine. Continue doing so. Um, we'll continue defending ourselves. Yeah. So after this episode's out, I'll be reaching out to him. And if he agrees to do a debate with you, will you be back here? I will be more than happy to debate him anytime, anywhere. Don't even give me the topic. Pranav, I'll give this to you in writing. If you reach out to him and he's willing to have a podcast with you. Yeah. Surprise debate. Surprise debate, give me the topic and give me the stance in person. For example, let's say he decides to speak against soy and he uses all my arguments to speak against soy. I'll take the pro-soy <laughs> argument and I'll still beat him. That is how confident I am in uh, just engagements of logic with, yeah. with, with someone like him. He does not know how to debate. He Forget debate. He's not well versed with logic. He's not well versed with nutrition and exercise. And it's evident. So I'll be more than happy to debate him. I'll be more than happy to debate anyone in this industry. Yeah. So please feel free to schedule that. I'll 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 I'll, I'll be here whenever. Perfect. And that sounds like a good way to end things here. So before we wrap it off, can you just tell the camera how they can find you, where they can find you, how they can register for your courses? Just a bit about that. So my website, amandugal.com is going to be live in a few days. So I guess that is going to be the easiest way to reach out to me. Outside of that, you can search Doc Dugal on Instagram. That's D-O-C, D-U-G-G-A-L, Doc Dugal. And that's where you can find my Instagram posts. And I'm usually active on Instagram almost every single day. That's about it. In fact, I mean, that's thank you for coming here. It's been a great uh, afternoon. And would love to have you back, hopefully, with Mr. Choksi. Let's see. <laughs> but yeah, thanks everyone for listening and thank you. Thanks for having me on, Pranav. Perfect. Thank you.